Frederick Eldon was Ellen White's nephew. Uh, his mother was Sarah Belden, who was Ellen White's older sister. And when Sarah died, one of the last things she asked Ellen White, and she says, please, would you watch out for Frank? Would you keep an eye on Frank? And in 1871, Frank had gotten in, was in tr trouble spiritually. And he had given up the Sabbath, and it looked like maybe he was going to uh, even walk away from faith issues. And Ellen White arranged to meet with him. And they sat down together. And Ellen White would describe it in these words. It's in letter 16, 1878. She said, I then had a long talk with Frank alone. I pled with him as a mother would plead for her son for hours with tears and entreaties. Are you following how, what's happening here? He finally promised me that he would break no more the Sabbath. She, she's caring for this nephew of hers and very anxious that he would be able to know the Lord and have an experience with the Lord. And they continue to have this uh, type of relationship together. And Frank went on to marry Hattie and began to develop his talents musically and also in a publishing of music. We have 12 songs in our hymn book, our current hymn book, both, where both the words and the music are by Frank Pell. And another four where he is the author of either the music or the words. So 16 hymns in our current hymn book are connected to Frank Belden. It's remembered by his daughter, Lenny. But during some meetings, because both Frank and Hattie would sometimes sing together, and sometimes songs that he had composed, and they were having some meetings on a few occasions where Frank and Hattie were listening carefully to the message, and they were appreciated the message, they understood what it was, they went off into the woods or off into a quiet place, and they sat down together, Frank working mostly on it though, with his, his wife helping him in some ways, because he was really a genius with music. And by the end of the message, they would be back in the church, and the two of them would come up together to the front of the church, and they would introduce a new song based on the message of the hour. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Has that ever happened to you in all of your years? <laughs> music, Dr. Moore. No? And so here we have this incredibly talented couple, talented songwriter, Frank. And uh, the Lord used him. He actually ended up putting to, helping put together the uh, hymn book in 1886, and then he came out with this book, Christ in Song. Have any of you heard of this hymn book? A few of you have. If you were, even when I was a boy, attending in some churches, smaller churches around, you'd go look in the pews, and you'd have the regular 18, 1941 church hymnal, because that, in those days that's the one we had, and then you'd see next to it, Christ in Song, that have the two books in the pew. And so this was the unofficial beloved, beloved hymn book of Adventists for a generation or maybe two generations, Christ in Song. And it was Frank Belden who put this together. This is his songbook. So incredibly talented. But something happened to Frank. Frank got involved in issues that kind of separated him from a living, active faith. At 1888, he was on the wrong side against Jones and Wagner, against the Righteousness by Faith message that Ellen White was supporting. Shortly after that, maybe partly because of his opposition and the support of Uriah Smith, he is brought on as one of the three officers of the editorial board for the Review and Herald. And it's not the editorial, it's the administrative board. And his job, part of it, is to make sure the Review and Herald is operating well. And so we came up with this idea. We could make more money if we lowered everyone's wages a little bit. And we raised the, the, the salary of the top leaders. <laughs> so we could get the best talent. Yeah, some of you are 
looking at me, you know, this is a terrible idea, right? To the church. So they did it. And another idea he had, there were two books that came out in 1888. One of them was Bible Readings for the Home Circle. Have you heard of that book? Maybe you could, I can picture it in my mind, the leather, Paul Porter version of this book. This book was multi-authored and had no royalties due from the press. So guess who makes all the money from Bible readings? The publishing house. The other book that came out was Great Controversy. Guess who owned that book? You don't have to guess. Who was it? Ellen White. And so, partly at Frank Belden's urging, which book got pressed and which book got kind of ignored? Bible readings was pressed forward. Great controversy was left, left and just to coast. And Ellen White wrote letter after letter about this issue. Frank again is behind this. And so things are not so well with this man. I wish I could show you a picture or two. I don't have a paper version with me today. But problems begin to happen in his own experience at home. You know, if you really want to know what your faith is, it's what's happening at home. Isn't that right? Your children know, and your spouse knows. And Ellen White would write him a letter that is quite, quite touching. Letter 99, 1901. She would write, God is love. Had you cherished his love, as it is your privilege to do, you would not now be as you are. You have talked, talked, talked of the failings of others. What type of person is this? A critical person. God does not want us to be critical people. And then she says this. This influence has harmed your wife and daughter. Your wife and daughter. So the passion of this letter is about his family and the relationship in his family with the Lord well, Frank Belden was let go after a while from his work at the Review and Herald. And uh, a few years later, he was promised a contract for a new book. Crisis of Conscience was the name of the book. And he was given an advance and promised a, a good sum, and he went to work on this book and began to write it. But as time went by, the press realized, no, what you're doing isn't going to work for us. And there was an escape clause seems, and they canceled the contract. And Frank was being critical already, was livid. And he wrote his aunt, and he said, you need to write a testimony. Not exactly those words, but that was the trajectory of his letter about this to the Review and Herald. So they'll pay me for this book. And publish this book. Instead, God gave a message for him she, he got the testimony. That wasn't what he intended. And this led to a period of a few years to where he becomes alienated from his aunt and alienated from the faith. I didn't have this experience personally, but I did talk to Kenneth Wood myself, and he told me the story when I was with Jim Nix on one occasion. And Jim tells the story as well. And that is... Uh, along about, I don't even know what year it was, uh, I think it was in the 1940s, Kenneth Wood went with Carlisle B. Haynes to visit Frank Belden because they wanted to get some of the music copyrights, they were purchasing some of the copyrights to Christ and Song and some of the other music that he had. And so they had already made arrangements and it was done. And so this was a friendly meeting because there was money coming his direction. He was living right here in Battle Creek. I could take him to where his home was. He had no chance to do that. And it went well. They shook hands. And as they went out, the words went towards Ellen White. And as, as uh, Kenneth Wood remembered it, he asked the question to Haynes as they were about to shake hands. He said, do you all believe in that old woman still? And you know who he meant by old woman? His own aunt, Ellen White. And Kenneth Wood said that Carlisle B. Haynes as an evangelist could be very direct with people. 
But in this case, he was quiet and gentle. And he said, yes, you do. And Frank Belden pulled his head hand back and would not shake hands with someone who believed in that old world. And so he ended his life bitter in opposition to Ellen White. But yet, during those troubled years, he would write, 1899, this song, number 45. Now you are in, I'm going to close with this for Sabbath school. You're in the seminary. You're preparing, Lord willing, maybe you have already been a pastor or teaching or chaplaincy or some area of ministry or you're planning to do this. You can do the right things, say the right words, the best words. You can even help other people and still have a distance between you and the Savior or me and the Savior. Mm -hmm. And so this song is a beautiful, precious song. But it also speaks to us, it calls to us to have that living personal experience. But if only Frank could have kept that, what a difference it would have made in his life. So as we prepare for our closing prayer, let's stand together and let's sing this all four verses of this song together.
right? Yes. We've just been covered by his life. This is no longer a dirge. It was a dirge before. This is very sad, our situation, right? But now we're on the last verse. So we need to pick it up and we need to rejoice as we sing this last verse. Okay? So let's try it. Reconcile. 